a lot of the best ideas were not actually coming out of brainstorming sessions and things like that, that they actually are from quiet thought and people kind of getting away from crowds to think about um, how something should be done. My name is Ben Charland, and you're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My conversation this week is with a friend of mine, Jody McPherson. You might have heard that name before. You might have heard the conversation with her before on this podcast. It was episode number 11. We talked about the book Selfie by Will Storr. This week, we're talking about another book, which is related to Selfie, called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. It's by Susan Kane, and Jody and I are able to really dig into this book, and I should note that these conversations are not book reviews, rather they are conversations and dialogues that use a particular book as the expert, as the piece that we're going to refer to as a springboard to conversation. Now, Jody and I tackle a lot of ground in this episode, individuality, workplaces, education, the trap of brainstorming, how to get out of your comfort zone, and why understanding the difference between introversion and extroversion is so important, but also why we should keep in mind the entirety of the pie of personality types and temperament. We talk about Brian Little, how psychology is important for survival, and that's why we're wired in some ways. Screen time, the way that things have changed with technology, how extroversion and the extrovert ideal, as Susan Cain calls it, can be a moral imperative. Communications, the power of listening, where do we go next, and towards the end, I give Susan Cain's questionnaire to find out if you're an introvert or likely to be one to Jody. And I think the answers are both, well, expected and also surprising. Anyways, if you like this podcast, please give it a rating and maybe even a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. And go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca, for all previous episodes to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode or any other, to get in touch on social media, to give me your suggestions for future guests and future topics to be discussed on this podcast, including books that you think might be appropriate for a conversation. Jody McPherson, welcome back. Hi. Hi. <laughs> glad to be back. I'm really glad to have you again. Uh, you got to be really careful this time, Jody, because if you're too good, you might become a co-host of this program. Oh, that would be exciting, <laughs> especially with all the people you've been meeting. Um, you were, uh, I think, episode, I think it was 14 or something around there, one of the early, early ones. And I have to say that you set the tenor in many ways for what this program is. The, the level of conversation I've had, I continue to have good feedback about our episode, which we did about a book called Selfie by Will Storr. That's right. And it's interesting because there are links between that book and this book called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking by Susan Cain. Um, we can talk about those links, um, but my first question, before, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question before my big question, which is, Jody, are you an introvert? Well, I, I really hate being categorized, but I would have to admit that I very much identify with introverts. How so? Like, why? Well, I'm, um, you know, I really uh, am in my own head a lot, I've realized. And I don't, for example, like to be the center of attention. Those are the kind of things that I've always been. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like when I read this book, it was so liberating for me. I mm. was like, finally, somebody who understands. There's a, a liberating line in the book that... It's actually the first sentence on the very first page of my copy, which is in the Manifesto for Introverts. And it says, there's a word for people who are in their heads too much, thinkers, not just introverts, which is the label that this book often gives it, but to be thoughtful, to be wanting solitude, to be wanting contemplation, to want a break, a pause from the, the busyness of the outside world. And there's, there's a principle in the book we can get to later about reactivity or sensitivity. And that often introverts are those who have high reactivity, who react a lot to the world and therefore need a break from it more commonly than other people. Um, so I'm, I'm unsure of where I am on this. I think I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert, but I'm certainly not far on the scale. I'm probably a low reactive introvert. 
if that makes sense. But again, we can talk about that later. So Jody, I wanted to ask you now the big question. According to this book, what on earth is going on? Well, I think what Susan came is getting at is that we, you know, we say that we value individuality, but really what we all too often are looking for is for one type of individual, and that's the extrovert. And so what's happened is that even though it is a very appealing personality style, it's become more of an oppressive standard that everybody has to meet. And we all feel like we have to conform, um, all being, you know, people who aren't necessarily in that extrovert realm. So um, her point is that we, we need to, rather than writing off like one third or to one half of people, uh, we can make the most of introvert strengths and, you know, the reasons are outlined in the book, but it's essentially that these are people that can help you, like, as she says, think deeply, strategize, solve complex problems, and spot canaries in your coal mine, which I really like. Do you find in your life that there is a pressure for you personally to be more extroverted, less shy, more interactive, more social, more of the extrovert ideal that Kane talks about? Yes, definitely. Um, I... I think that uh, I was married to an extrovert for more than 20 years. And it wasn't, you know, there's a really interesting part of the book where they talk about that relationships with uh, a married couple who are extrovert versus introvert. And, um, you know, there were some good things about that. I was able to be comfortably myself and my extrovert husband was comfortably himself. But it, it, at the end of the day, I'm now divorced, but at the end of the day, it didn't really work that well for us. So, um, and it also depends on what kind of area of your life. I find that the, the book covers a lot around the workplace. And I think a lot of workplaces really expect that extrovert standard to be met. Uh, and, you know, there's some, not all, of course, but uh, a lot of them just sort of have one idea of what a leader looks like. And they try to make everybody conform to that. And they don't necessarily um, include other types of leaders. And so in that world, uh, definitely. Um, one yeah. of the most horrifying parts of the book, maybe that's too tough a word to put on it, was when Kane went to the Harvard Business School and learned about how the extrovert ideal is the ideal of graduates of the Harvard Business School. So that if you're a student there, your entire job is to interact with others. And that if you're spending time on your own in any way, that's not only socially frowned upon, it seems to be academically frowned upon. That you should be doing all assignments with other people. You should be always doing some kind of a group work assignment. And that if you're missing out with other people, you're missing out on your education, you're missing out on your future. And I remember feeling ill in reading that. And how I would just, I'm so glad I never went to a school like that or, or, or know now how much a school like that would be bad for me because I need my own time. I, I like to be alone in a room. I like to go for a walk by myself to think about things and to be, pre to be made to feel that that is somehow a negative or holding me back or is not allowed would just be crushing spiritually, emotionally, and probably physically too. I mean, there's a few references in this book about how, how important your, your, obviously your temperament and your mental health is connected to your physical well-being. Um, and she does spend a time with some, some researchers. But yeah, that section about the Harvard Business School, which is also similar to the time she spent with, at the Tony Robbins seminar, uh -huh, which is, the, right. again, the extrovert ideal, but in a self-help packaging. Yeah. Um, did you have a similar reaction when you got to those sections? Oh, yeah. I really, really enjoyed the descriptions, both of the Tony Robbins um, seminar that she went to and also when she talked a little bit about evangelical Christians. And that was a very interesting part. But back to the uh, Harvard Business School stuff, it was just amazing to read that because I, I think that her her insights into education are really important if we're going to correct this. Um, and the whole idea that group work is the ultimate. And if you can't, you know, if, if you're not good in a group work setting, well, you're just a failure, really. That's kind of what the philosophy seems to be. But I think that she makes some excellent points and, you know, ha uses research that people have done that show that 
um, a lot of the best ideas were not actually coming out of brainstorming sessions and things like that, that they actually are from quiet thought and people kind of getting away from crowds to think about um, how something should be done. So I really found that interesting and lots of things we can learn from that. And I think that um, she's actually gone on from this book because I actually was surprised this book was written way back in 2012. And she's now, st instead of writing a second book, she's also started this quiet revolution thing. She's set up an institute of leadership and she's really taking this idea and, and making it something important for uh, education, for kids as well. Um, she, you know, I have to admit that when I read the part about collaboration and her thoughts on it, I was a little bit taken aback because even though I'm an introvert, I'm, I've always been a huge proponent of brainstorming. And in fact, I love brainstorming. But then I realized that, yeah, I love brainstorming, but I always, at the end of the brainstorming session, I never feel like we came up with the actual idea in the brainstorming session. We more or less just kind of loosened up a bunch of ways of thinking. Kind of stirred the pot a bit. Yeah. 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 But really, I always like to take those brainstorming sessions and go back and think about them and then come up with further ideas. I did that just recently. So, I mean, I think that um, what she's what she's talking about is that not one way is bad or the other way is bad or the other way, and the other way is the only way to do things. What she's saying is that we have to balance it. So, yeah, we can do the collaboration, the group work, but we also need to do that thoughtful individual spend time doing that and thinking and and there are people out there who are really good at it and we should listen to them. Yeah. It, which is an important point for me too, because sometimes I, I have an introvert ideal, right? I have this idea in my head that my own time, my going for a walk, my self-contemplation is where I'm of maximum use to myself and to the world. And sometimes I need to be reminded that there is a world out there that I need to be part of. So this book was helpful for me because it spoke my language, but it was also, you know, sometimes there may be circumstances where the other side might be needed for me personally. You know, one example of that is, I don't know if you've seen the movie, movie Into the Wild. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, so spoiler, spoiler alert for this movie, but at the end of it, he's dying. He dies. It doesn't end which well. Which isn't really a spoiler because that's the real story. The guy dies in the, in the wilderness because he goes up to Alaska by himself and it is obsessed with this idea of being completely alone and away in isolation from the world. And he dies because he's not prepared to handle it. He's a young kid who dies of food poisoning from these berries that he eats. But... What he realizes as he's dying, and he wants to escape, he wants back into the world because he knows he's going to die here, he writes in his journal, happiness only real when shared. And that was really powerful for me because happiness for me can be, you know, something that I'm doing alone. But that's not sustainable. It's not real unless it's shared with somebody. And I discovered that years ago by myself when traveling. That traveling wasn't the same unless you could share it with somebody, share the experiences with someone. Um, and I, yeah, it's an important balancing act for me, and I'm glad you said that. Um, there's a key question that, that Cain asks in the beginning of the book, which is essentially that um, if you're an introvert, should you maximize the things that come naturally to you? Or should you stretch yourself out of your comfort zone? I don't know if she gives a really clear answer to that in the book, but what do you think of it? Oh, I think that you have to move out of your comfort zone. Um, and I think that, I think that's what she, I do think she was trying to get at that in the book. Although sometimes it feels a little bit like she's going swinging a little too far into the introverts and how, you know, they might be better than extroverts. Yeah. And <laughs> I started to get a little uncomfortable because I don't think you're going to convince many people if you, if you try to say one is better than the other, but. Well, and she also know. needs to convert, convince extroverts here too. That's right. That, yeah. that your ideal is not the ultimate uh, in the world. Yeah. 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 And there are lots of examples in the book of extroverts actually who appreciate introverts. So, uh, she's not, I don't think she was saying that all extroverts are just, you know, anti introvert and that they're, you know, it's an us and versus, versus them. But yeah, exactly what you said is that we have to try and, and move out of our comfort zone. I've, you know, tried some, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so well, not so much, um, to do that my entire life. Um, I've always known that I preferred, 
you know, quiet, small group things and large, uh, you know, groups of people and public speaking just terrifies me. So I, and also I find it's just overstimulating. So for example, Skype for me is just a great filtering tool. So I, um, I, when I stand up in front of a room of people and I feel everyone's eyes on me, it almost feels physically painful. It's like, oh my God, I'm in front of all these people. Look at them looking at me. <laughs> and it's just like very scary. Um, but I find for some reason I can be on a Skype call with like 10 or 10 people and I can see their faces on the screen looking at me, but it, it just doesn't seem as scary for some reason. So I don't know why that is. It's just like, it just creates this filter that makes it more comfortable for me. That's so, so interesting because my my feeling about Skype is not the opposite, but different. So when I'm on a Skype call, I find myself underwhelmed and understimulated by the Skype. And I find myself doing other things and not paying attention. Really? So I'm really, I have only done in this podcast, I've only done one other conversation by Skype. It was with Terry O'Reilly. It was episode... Uh, I, it was in the 40s, I think. And um, it was great. W it worked really wonderfully. But I worried that if I did a Skype conversation with somebody, that the two sides wouldn't really be paying attention as we're paying attention now. We're in the same room. You can't avoid me. I can't avoid you. If I'm you know, looking at my phone, obviously, it's going to be not only disrespectful, but it's going to break what we're doing right now, this clear dialogue that we're having. But if I'm on a Skype call, I can, I don't know, I can be looking at something else. I can, and with, with Terry, we didn't actually do video. It was pure audio. Right. So I could easily have been looking at my phone. He could have been building a ship out of wood as far as I know. Yeah. I don't think he was. But if he was, then all the kudos to him because he still looked, seemed like he was paying full attention. But the, it, 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 yeah, Skype and someone through a tube or a box is underwhelming and understimulating to me. Oh my gosh, that's a, interesting because I actually don't find it understimulating. In fact, I love it. I actually, you know, I enjoy trying to pick each person on this thing and ask them questions. And I ask a lot of questions when I'm doing Skype so I don't just do all the talking. And people respond back. And um, I notice when other people do Skype calls, they tend to just talk and they don't listen to the other people on the Skype call. And I'm the, t the total opposite. I actually use it as a way of kind of sorting everything into sort of a manageable format that yeah. I can address. And I prefer actually if there's like the person, even if they don't put, you know, it on video, if they put a picture of themselves so I can see their face, I like that as well. So uh, I, tend, I tend not to be great on conference calls. I don't really like that as much for the reason that you mentioned. Okay. Right. I feel like sometimes if you're on, if you're just hearing the person's voice, you don't know what they're doing. They could be, like you said, doing a million other things and you're not sure if they're actually paying attention. Right, right. <laughs> so, but you know what I find really interesting is how we got, like she, she sort of went back to the history of how we got to this place where, and she went back to Dale Carnegie, which I found really interesting because I actually picked up an old book once, for, you know, one of the originals uh, books by Dale Carnegie. How to Win Friends, to win and, friends and, and Influence people. people at a garage sale once. And I remember reading it and I was thinking, this is insane. Like, I don't, I don't understand this at all. Like, I don't know what, but I said, now I, now I see why everyone is trying to push me in this direction. Cause when I was a kid, my, my parents were, I think both introverts. I don't know for sure, but they were definitely leaning more introverts. So when I got out into the world and real and met all these extroverts, I was just blown away. I'm like this whole other breed of person. Like, I think that was my ex-husband as well. Is like, wow, you know, this is amazing. This person has so much confidence. You're just kind of, you know, drawn to them. But, you know, the, the idea of Carnegie that he was actually an introvert who came up with this way of coping, you know, with his work and what he had to do in his sales work. So, um, well, and there's this other, not character, this figure in the book, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's a professor whose classes are oversubscribed. Yes. He's such, I don't know if you have the name in front of you, yeah. but, but, um, Brian Little. Right. And, um, who people just love. And he's got such a way of giving a class in front of hundreds and hundreds of people and just seems like he is energized beyond belief. And yet he is deeply introverted and needs to recharge in a cabin by himself in, I guess it was, it was on Ontario in the, in the woods Canadian. of Ontario. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this interesting dynamic and the problem that he faces is that people expect him 
to be extroverted when they approach him in a hallway or in the street or whatever. And they realize quickly that it's not that that's a performance or a show, or maybe that it is, but that there are different facets of his personality or temperament. Yeah, I watched his TED Talk. Which, I, which is really cool to see. Because after she explained kind of all of that about him and to see him actually is, is exactly how she described it. You can tell that he just can't wait to get off that stage. Mm. <laughs> but while he's there, boy, he's gonna, he, he really did, um, he explained things very well. You could tell that he'd rehearsed a lot to get to where he was. But his, his ideas are extremely interesting too because he talks about personality traits, not just you know, he's, he's looking at trait psychology. So he, he has his own set of, you know, tr personality traits that he's interested in, and how they work together. And this is where you get into the complexity of this is that it's not just like extroverts versus in introversion, mm -hmm. extroversion versus introversion, there's so many other factors like uh, agreeableness. And I think he talks about, um, Ex, uh, sorry, conscientiousness and, you know, people that are just very concerned about following the rules and doing things correctly. And it, it's, it's also a little bit, um, the connection back to our previous book that we talked about, he talks about n being neurotic, um, which is also part of what we discussed in selfie and what the author wrote about there. So, so, um, yeah, I just, um, Brian Little is, is definitely a, a piece of this like there's a few people if, I mean she references a lot of research but I think that there are certainly some people that stood out for me as really having some great ideas well the introvert extrovert axis is often called the north south of temperament right so do you think that if we focus on just this one axis again are we missing the bigger pie of personality of, of how we can not just personality but temperament the things that we're born with the things that we can't change, right? I mean, I think what, what I'm getting from this book is that, and, and from our conversation, is that you're a, a high reactive or a high sensitive person. You've always been, it's how you were born. I imagine that as a baby, and this is coming from the book, you were probably a very, for your first four months, probably very active. I don't know if you know this from, from your parents or from anyone that told you this, but the, what um, Susan Cain talks about in the book is that a really high reactive toddler a, a kid who reacts to everything and cries or laughs no matter whatever happens will often become an introverted person because they are re reacting highly to the world. I was probably a low, a calm, really um, quiet kid for my first four months and then I became an absolute maniac by the time I was five years old. But in that first four months, I was pretty calm. So I think of myself as probably a low reactive person. I need a lot of stimulus, right? So a conference call will just kill me. I'll just, I'll be so bored. I need more. I need to go play with Lego as I'm listening to it. And then of course I'm distracted and then yeah. all bets are off. But, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a high reactive person becomes an introvert. It's just more likely to be that way. Um, and this idea of temperament and personality, are we missing this bigger picture? by just focusing on this one axis. I think so. If if we came away from this book thinking that, okay, now that's it, right? It's like a binary and everyone's in one or the other and all that other stuff doesn't make sense. I mean, that would be no good for anybody. I mean, we really do have to understand it's way more complex than that. But um, I found that interesting too, that that whole section about how, you know, you're overstimulated because I, I, I will tell you one story about my extrovert, you know, relationship with my extro extrovert husband is that he really needed a lot to get his adrenaline pumping. Like he needed to skydive, that kind of thing. So he would always That's say, very to me, extrovert. <laughs> yeah, he would say like, uh, you know, don't you want to get that adrenaline rush? Like you're just about to die. And I'm like, I get that when I drive to work every day in the car. <laughs> so yeah, if it's, it's a pursuit of adrenaline, I get it all the time uh, from very simple things. So I don't have to go that extra mile to get that. I'm overstimulated already. So I thought mm. that that, for me, that was kind of to be able to articulate it that way. I suddenly didn't feel so bad that I didn't want to go skydiving or, you know. Well, and actually you're lucky. I know. You don't, have to, you don't have to pay any money that you like, you know, your ex-husband would have to pay however many hundreds of dollars to go skydiving to get that one, you know, moment of thrill. You get to have it every day. Well, that's what I used to say. But when I read the book, I realized something else about it is that, um, you know, like the, the pleasure or the reward center in, in extroverts brains is actually more wired to accept that kind of stimulus. Mm -hmm. So 
in somewhat unfairness to introvert introverts, we actually try to moderate it. So when we sense that we're getting overstimulated, we react to sort of stop that overstimulation instead of just enjoying it and reveling in it, which could potentially have a survival impact, you know, impact because there's lots of times where you're doing things that are very rewarding and pleasurable, but might not be necessarily good for you. So it's, I think it's still un, unclear to me whether this is, uh, these traits are, a, you know, some sort of a, a, a survival instinct or not. Well, I think Kane does allude to that without, I don't think she ever interviews an evolutionary biologist or anything like that, no, but yeah. she does allude to this idea that these traits are necessary for the survival of the band, the pack, the tribe, the family, whatever. Because if everyone is going to pursue risk with abandon, then we're all going to die. But if everyone is just okay to hang around and not, and not do anything that's going to change things, then we're all going to die. Right, and and so humanity, as a as a eusocial species, as we're often called, requires a mix of both. We require those who take risks and the, who, those who will stay home. Those who are, nah, I'm okay today. You guys go out, right? Um, because obviously, one or the other will lead to our complete destruction. But I think also one will learn from the other. It's not just that one will be alive and the other will die. One will learn and 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 push the other out of their comfort zone. You know, I need people who probably will make me calm down, but I also need people who will bring me out into social circumstances. Um, you know, that might be an odd combination, but, but I'm better for those who bring me into those um, situations, ways of thinking, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was another um, researcher, Dr. Elaine Aaron, who I found really fascinating too. And, you know, I think that she's really gone down the path of sensitivity, which is a completely different, I mean, I think the numbers are something like, you know, 70% of sensitive people who consider themselves to be highly sensitive people are also introverts. But that doesn't mean that all introverts are sensitive, but there's a strong connection between those two qualities. And the, the highly sensitive people um, are really tuned into other people like they're very empath empathetic and they're very concerned about how other people are feeling and, and if people don't fit in a group they're the ones that bring them in and but it can also be detrimental because highly sensitive people also can be affected greatly by things they see so I mean this fits with me like I can remember you know in my early 20s watching a show that was very violent and someone was killed it was an actual like news footage of someone being basically beaten to death by a group of people villagers because they thought that person was doing something really awful and I watched that and I literally for days and weeks afterwards I couldn't stop thinking about it it was just so upsetting and some people really do have that kind of sensitivity and I think you discover it quickly. So like, you know, as soon as you realize you're like that, you avoid certain things that you know are just not, you know, horror movies with a lot of, you know, violence and gore. You know, if you can't handle it, then you just realize it pretty quickly that it's not, you know, it's not for you. But I think it is important to recognize that those people play a role. Um, and it's also been, I think, really helpful for a lot of those people to find that there's other people like them. Because a lot of times you feel like, wow, I'm watching this in a room of all these people and I'm the only one who's crying, you know, that kind of thing. So. Well, and one thing that's really important in what you just said is, is how good of a book this is for a parent or a future parent or a potential parent um, and how to raise kids. Because we will, if we accept the extrovert ideal, then we will want our kids to be social. We'll want them to do group work. We'll want them to play in the playground all day long. And if they come inside and play video games or play, um, you know, cards by themselves or something, are, oh, are they, are they hurt? Are they being bullied? Are they depressed? Are they just too shy? Um, shyness is not necessarily the same thing as being introverted That's right, because yeah. shyness can be based on fear and fear in that case is, no, is not necessarily a good thing. But... That doesn't mean that they're not being productive and happy in their time. And if a sensitive kid, someone who responds to their environment, is penalized for crying, for example, crying all the time, 
Well, I mean, there's obviously a balance here because you can't live in this world if you're always crying. I mean, literally, that's just not going to work for you. But we also need to wear a suit of armor as we go through our lives every day. If we, if we don't, we're going to be hurt. So there, it, in education and in raising a kid, that's important to you know, know where your set of armor is and how to carry your shield, but also know how to take that off and when to take it off and to know that when you take it off and cry in a movie or relate to somebody else, that's not a bad thing. There may be a time and a place for it to protect yourself, but that doesn't, it shouldn't be seen as a negative thing that should be discouraged and pushed to the side. And I think that's a really important lesson for parents, especially in North America, where the extrovert ideal is primal. Um, or, 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 or is, is, is number one. Um, yeah, I think yeah. I really like the section where she talks about teaching and she, she really gives some practical advice for teachers and how to make the classroom inclusive of all different types of personalities. And I think that's part of the answer for sure. We have to, because of course schools have responded to the workplace. Um, if, if the workplace values these qualities of extroversion, and they um, then there's a lot of pressure, I think, on teachers to basically prepare those kids for that. In fact, I think my own kids, I am guilty of that, where I I really did not want them to be as introverted as me. I wanted to prepare them for a world that was going to expect them to be more extroverted. Um, if I could go back, I probably wouldn't have maybe, you know, pushed them so far in that direction. Uh, I had a phone conversation with my daughter about this very thing, and she, to my shock and horror, basically it told me that she felt that as a child I had pushed her to do more extroverted things and, you know, when she really just wanted to sit and read a book and, mm. and I'm like, oh, this is terrible, I feel awful. But, you know, it, it it's just something that we all fall under this spell, you know, even I did. I thought it was, I thought it was the way that to be. One interesting point that came up so far is how Jody and I react differently to Skype, a technology that allows you to make a phone call over the internet and be able to see the other person. I find it understimulating. I find it underwhelming, kind of like Jody finds a conference call. But Jody finds it the perfect filter for her when she's doing creative work and communications work with other people. Now, coming up in this episode, we talk about a lot of different things. But one thing I wanted to point out is this idea that you should have the courage to speak softly. Now, just like Skype, having the courage to speak softly applies both to introverts and extroverts. To an introvert, it could mean have the courage to speak. To an extrovert, it could mean have the courage to speak softly. And both are very important. And all of this is coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. But let me just ask, though, are things different now with screens, with a mobile phone, with a tablet? Are they are they're certainly, I know they're different than when I was growing up as a kid, when there was no screen anywhere except for maybe a TV in the living room. Um but it seems like we might be living in a different time where a kid having too much screen time, too much alone time, an extrovert might get all of their stimulus from that screen and don't need to seek it out from other people. Is that actually, are we living in a different time? Is, that a, is there a different danger here? Uh, I think so, um, definitely. Um, but I think in the classroom where you, you don't bring those devices into the classroom. So, you know, the teacher is really... Um, in that when she, when she has those kids in that room it's a really he or she has a really great opportunity to try and break free of that idea uh what happens when they leave the classroom is is a whole other thing i mean they uh, there's also evidence that that introverts for example really do well on things like social media because it gives them a voice that they might not otherwise have also social you know being on in front of a screen doesn't necessarily mean that you're not um interacting so, and we, we tend to judge those kind of interactions a bit harshly. You know, if you're, you know, if you're not interacting face to face with your friends, that's bad. But what if you are having really great conversations with friends online? And that, that are, are stimulating your mind and making right. you think. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're a sensitive type or a person who might, you know, have some mental illness issues and having that ability to reach out and talk to someone is not necessarily a bad thing, but the but the other thing I worry about though is that we need to do these in tandem because you can't if you're going to start teaching kids that um, in being an introvert is great and you know you, you the teachers need to, to to bring this into the classroom, but that we also have to do it 
in the workplace as well, because right now the workplace is, is very slow to adapt to this. I remember it was only recently where I just had in my career, because I've been in, in, you know, working in communications for, for almost 30 years. But I remember the first time that someone actually in a group meeting said, now we're going to do a combination of types of activities. We're going to do some group things, but we're also going to do some individual work to, to basically cover off all the different types of personalities. And, and I don't know if she actually used the words and in introverts, but the, the whole idea that in order to, like, this was to do some sort of a strategic planning exercise, w in order to sort of to bring all of the people at the table and all of their ideas, I thought that was amazing. And I was so impressed with that facilitator because I thought, this this doesn't happen enough, right? Facilitators will come in and they have the same old bag of tricks. Like, it's always the same thing, you know, group work. And, and as we, you know, as is talked about in the book, what happens with the group, the people who talk the most, their ideas are the ones that get moved forward. And their ideas are the ones that may not have been contemplated deeply. That's right. They're not always the best ideas, as, as she says. So, so I think we do have to, you know, start with kids. But if we're going to send kids out into the workplace and then they're confronted with an entirely different situation than what they were taught, um, then we could be setting them up for failure. Well, that's a really good point because ter parents and teachers need to prepare kids for the real world. And if the real world is one where the extrovert ideal is number one and where you're going to have to know how to work with other people, then it's our job as parents and teachers to prepare our kids for that, regardless of how introverted they are. If there's no path for you as, as an introvert who just wants to read their book or stay on their screen, then, then we're, we might be doing you a disservice by letting you go there, right? Yeah. So in fact, you might feel guilty about raising your kids in a certain way, but there may have been ways you prepared them for for the real world. And this is the real world in North America. It's not the real world that will always be for humans. I mean, Kane talks about in the book how different cultures have different approaches to this. There's a much more group-oriented and, you know, contemplative culture in China, for example, where it's okay to spend all your time, you know, practicing calligraphy, for example. Yeah. Um and, and we forget that in our culture, that it's not, this isn't universal, that there are different ways of doing things. And I wonder, you know, um, Kane talks about how there are between one third and one half of people are introverts. I wonder if that statistic is the same or different in somewhere like China or Japan, Korea, um, where the culture is different. Or is this a deep temperamental um, thing? Yeah, I, I don't know. She she talks about a lot about the science and brains and, you know, how this could be quite hardwired. But she also, you know, talks a lot about the fact that a lot of it is not hardwired. It's things that you develop or learn. So um, that whole collectivist idea, too, I find fascinating how, you know, in other, you know, cultures but outside of Western cultures, um, the idea that somebody who's quiet and who isn't trying to dominate the conversation is the leader. So that, to me, is just really exciting. Those who speak don't know. Those who know don't speak. Yes, yeah. And she talks quite, a, there's quite a lot dedicated in, in the book to that and understanding it because I think we do need to recognize that this is something that we, we don't, we're not, like a slave to this idea just because you know at the turn of the the 20th century we decided all of a sudden that you know salesmanship and extroversion is the number one way to be we also have the ability to kind of cor course correct and say wait a second you know maybe we should rethink this because there's certain there's certain evidence that we might be going down a path towards um taking it way too far you know like where we think that actually not only is this a great way to be but for the sake of, you know, getting things done, but that it actually makes you a better person, you know, for some reason that being an extrovert is sort of like a, a moral imperative that, and this is kind of where she touches on the whole evangelical Christian movement and the way that, um, you know, the, that it's going with the, this huge stage presence of people and the, the preachers and the way that they um, present themselves is quite interesting. Also, the fact that if you go back in history, it was there were two types of people. There were were kind of the um, the the leaders, and then the, the the clergy were always behind the scenes, you know, sort of advising. But they, you know, there's this new 
process where the clergy is actually out in front. They're the ones, mm-hmm. you know, I watched United Shades of America, I think it's called. And he went out and basically interviewed some of these um, massive churches where there's a preacher at the front of the room, like Tony Robbins style, uh, motivating like twenty to 30,000 people to give him money. I mean, it's just incredible. And there seems to be a, a scary kind of offshoot of this where extroverts are being held out as some sort of godlike thing, which is really frightening when you think about it. Yeah. And it, it, well, that's just what happens when we build an ideal in our culture where the extrovert, the one who is connected, the networker, the connector, I think it's uh, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell calls them the connectors, those who bring all these people together and therefore create innovation and, and even wealth for our society are those, are those who can make all these different connections. So we value that because it produces real economic benefits. It produces real personal, emotional benefits. I mean, um, watching a movie, for example, a movie is a collaboration between thousands of people. You know, I can't imagine how many people work on a Star Wars movie or an Avengers movie. You know, they must be in the thousands, maybe even the tens of thousands. That's a massive collaboration that requires leadership, but also these connectors to bring people together. There's also institutions that are involved too. Now, if everyone is just sitting back and reading their book, obviously we're not going to get these prizes of economics, but also prizes of culture, um, and when we might be at a loss for it. But the problem is, I think that Cain continues to talk about, is that we're out of balance, we're out of equilibrium, and that there are many, many people who are being left behind, but with those people, many ideas, many innovations that are being left behind as a result of this too hard of a focus. Yeah, there's a really good um, uh, part of her TED Talk, Susan Cain's TED Talk, where she she basically brings out a huge duffel bag and and she has it on stage with her the whole time and the end of the at the end of the TED talk I think her message is to the introverts is that yeah w- you know I'm all about you I understand you and we we like you kind of thing but you have to unpack your suitcase I think is the way she describes it and she actually physically opens up her duffel bag and takes out what's in there which is of course books um and she says, it's not, you know, it's not an, it's okay for you to want to go off and do your thing as an individual and you're thinking, but you have to share more of that with the rest of us too, because your ideas and thoughts and your thinking on things is really important to share. And in fact, more important to share if we live in a culture where the other side is so valued Yeah, because we need a a break from it. We need an antidote. Yeah. Um, I read a, the New York Times book review of, of Quiet. Um, from 2012, which talks about, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's quite a nice review, but in the end it does provide a criticism, which is that in this book, introversion means so many different things, right? It's not just the, you know, the Myers-Briggs idea of temperament, or it's not just the big five idea of introversion, um, but it means sensitivity, reactivity, um, being good natured, being thoughtful, being intellectual, being contemplative, um, being self-loving, being loving of others. I mean, it means everything and therefore it means nothing as a result. So that's one of the criticisms. And the other one is, is that it not accuses her, but it suggests that maybe this is a bit of a false crusade. And I just wanted to get your take on it, that the the article essentially suggests that there are many introverts out there who are perfectly happy and not under pressure from anybody. For example, a scientist working in a lab, going about their work. No one expects them to be more extroverted, or almost nobody. I've met professors who are quite introverted and who say that they, there is a pressure from the university to, come on, promote more of your work, publish more of your stuff, um, get out there and do a TED Talk or something like that. But there's a lot of people out there who don't face the same pressure. Now, that might have been because it was seven years ago and our culture has shifted even more towards the extrovert ideal. But I also wanted to ask, is there, I mean, is this, is this book a bit of a, you know, that classic American nonfiction book of, hey, look, everyone, there's a problem and it's the biggest problem of our time and we've got to deal with it. Is it a bit hyperbolic? Mm. Well, I think there's... In some ways, in order to get your book on the bestseller list, you have to do a little bit of that. And so that might be somewhat true. And that gets at how I felt some at some points when I was reading the book. I was like, wow, this is, yeah, maybe a little too over the top here in mm-hmm. pro one side or the other. Mm-hmm. But I do think that that process of 
of understanding a more complex idea, we sometimes have to go through a simplified or a step-by-step -step process to get there. So in other words, um, I don't think that it, it, it this focus on extroverts versus introverts is necessarily the end a game where we want to be, but it might move us along a path towards understanding that it it it's way more complicated than we thought and we should stop you know kind of trying to put people into categories like why are we trying to do this you know and I think that books that sort of make you rethink things are are super important uh, on you know that's interesting that you mentioned the like the the professors uh, when I used to work I used to work at a university where we were you know, trying to talk about a lot of the research and the researchers were, you know, some of them were, were not great at explaining the, the significance of their research results. And one of my jobs was to work with them on that and to help them, you know, recognize that your work is important. You need to talk about it, even if it's really difficult to explain to people. And a lot of times they... I didn't expect, like, I guess the difference is I didn't expect them to suddenly overnight become, a, you know, a communicator who could explain wh whatever it was they were doing an experiment on snails or something and what's the significance of that. But I, w I would hope that they could sit down with someone like me who is a professional communicator and work with me to try to help them explain their work because I do think that uh, you know, basic science is a, an example of this, is that a lot of the stuff they do is hard. It's really hard to explain why you have to do this basic science in order to get further kind of more important and really hard science results. This is a very important part of that process. And it's sometimes hard to explain that and the scientists don't want to. You know, a lot of them will just like, just leave me alone. I just need to go do my research. But It's interesting because that's analogous to, to raising a kid or teaching a kid. You know, if a kid's just you know, reading a book all day, at some point you want to say, hey, maybe you should write something and not yeah. just read. Not, not that there's anything wrong with reading, but maybe there's something in you that's stirring and that you don't know yet, or you don't know if it's okay, or especially you don't know if it will be valued enough. And it takes someone like you as a communicator or, or a parent or a teacher to, to give that message to a kid, because if, if it's not coming, it might not be apparent. Right. It might, my worldview might just be, again, going back to the screen example, consumed entirely in this device. But it, how can I make a new device, for example, if I can't see it from the other side, if yeah. I can't step away from it and understand what it actually does? Yeah. And I'm just living completely within its paradigm. And it's really timely because we are having, you know, conversations about what is the purpose of education? What is the purpose of our universities and colleges? Is the sole purpose to basically churn out good employees and get them jobs? And do we do we p basically say that if a person graduates with a university degree, their salary that they earn is the most important thing? And therefore, if you are not churning out graduates that are earning a certain salary that we decide is acceptable, we're going to cut your funding, or you know, we're, you're just you're not going to get the attention you deserve. So, so as much as you know, I think introverts would love to just kind of retreat back into themselves. And um, it really is not a long-term solution for anything, even an introvert, I don't think. I mean, you're going to end up like John Krakauer in, in your book that you use as an example. It's, it's not. It doesn't work. So we really have to push ourselves outside. Um, and we have to recognize that I really like something she said, which is to have the courage to speak softly. So you don't have to go out and be like those extroverts, but you have to at least make an attempt to try to share your thoughts on things, um, speak up and put a value on what you have to offer that is is different. It's but there's also a word of advice for extroverts too. Have yeah. the courage to speak softly. Exactly. Have the courage to not go into a room and pound your fist and, and be loud because you might actually gain more by listening That's by, right. and by not um, fighting so hard right off the get-go. And in fact, fighting can take many forms. Um, Jody, I'd like to ask you the questionnaire that Susan Cain has in the beginning of her book to give a sense of what introversion, extroversion is. 
So um, are you ready for it? Which, which, this is this is the true or false test. Okay. Um, and essentially she says, if you're still not sure where you fall on the introvert extrovert spectrum, you can assess yourself here. Answer each question, true or false, choosing the answer that applies to you more often than not. Okay. Um, number one, do you prefer one-on-one -on -one conversations to group activities? <laughs> true. Do you often prefer to express yourself in writing? True. Yes. Do you enjoy solitude? True. Do you seem to care less about your peers, about, uh, than your peers, about wealth, fame, and status? True. Do you dislike small talk, but enjoy talking in depth about uh, topics that matter to you? True. Do you people tell you that you're a good listener? True. Oh, are you not a big risk taker? Uh, true. Do you enjoy work that allows you to dive in with few interruptions? True. <laughs> Do you like to celebrate birthdays on a small scale with only one or two close friends or family members? True. Do people describe you as soft-spoken or mellow? True. <laughs> Do, right. Do you prefer not to show or discuss your work with others until it's finished? Uh, maybe not so much in that one, but... Do you dislike conflict? Uh, no, I, I, I'd have to say no. I, Ooh. I, false, yeah. Do you do your best work on your own? False. Oh, do you tend to think before you speak? Yes, true. Do you feel drained after being out and about, even if you've enjoyed yourself? True. Do you often let calls go through to voicemail? Uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to choose, would you prefer a weekend with absolutely nothing to do to one with too many things scheduled. I'm kind of both ways on that one. Okay. I like to sh I like to change it up. Yeah. Okay. Do you in, uh, do you not enjoy multitasking? True. Can you concentrate easily? True. And finally, in classroom situations, do you prefer lectures to seminars? I'm not really sure. I don't if really I know, know what that one, means yeah. either. <laughs> yeah. But uh, of the 19, you said true. All but three and a half. Yeah, so, pretty heavily weighted. So according to Susan, I mean, on a very basic level, just based on that, you're quite an introvert. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it's it, it is hard at, in the workplace to be an introvert. Uh, I find, and but I do feel like back to what you were saying about listening is as as extroverts. I think if you recognize that you and I, I have seen extroverts do this. They can master the skill. They, it, it, it hurts them. Like it, you can almost tell they're in physical pain because they're not speaking. But, you know, they they do can learn to listen. And I think that the benefits of doing that are just amazing for them. Um, the book also talks about different types of leadership and how different types of employees respond better to different types of leaders, which I think is really important information to understand, is that if you've got a group of people who are highly motivated who who are innovative and really just top notch people who are need, just need permission to go an introvert w is more able to kind of harness that energy and let it happen then an extrovert has to work against their natural instinct in order to let that group go but if you've got a group of people who are are ne not necessarily i don't want to portray them too negatively but you know people who are looking for someone to tell them kind of give them direction and they don't aren't necessarily self-motivated to do something maybe people who are doing work that's more repetitive and need inspiration then an extrovert is probably better an introvert not so much so it's really important to understand the differences totally there. Yeah. and one counterintuitive notion that i've always known or since i worked in the theater um, was that often introverts make the best, not only artists, but actors, which is counterintuitive because we think that an actor is the one who's happy to go on stage, happy to be in front of the camera, meeting and talking to all these people. But the best actors are the ones who listen first, whose first instinct and impulse is to listen to the other person and then react only when they need to. Now, obviously, someone who's too introverted and who never reacts could never be an actor yeah. um, and there needs to be a balance there. But if that's your first instinct, often you're going to be much more engaging on stage or in front of a camera than yeah. someone who's just going to dart after the next thing and the next thing. And it's, it's interesting because we think of artists as being those who are going to jump out into the street and, and grab the next thing and make something out of it. Often artists are those who are going to first go into a quiet room and only do those things when they're, when they need to, or when they've learned to overcome those fears. Often an actor needs to overcome the fear of being in front of a room of people, just like everyone else, um, which is which is interesting. 
But I think also a lesson for for any profession, any career, that listening is so important. Yeah. No, I, I really took a lot out of that section too about the creative people being a lot of them introverts and it made sense to me I mean I'm I'm a family of three kids I'm the oldest my two siblings are both in the theater and some one is a performer and one is just a lifelong theater person and again what you just said is so true he I feel like he is an introvert my brother even though he's been in the theater his entire life um because when he's not on stage, he's he's doing those solo things. You know, he's reading, he's thinking, he's just, he's, he, you know, he, he has that solitude and he loves to do that stuff. But then when he gets on stage, he just like transforms. So mm. the other thing that she said was really interesting in the book is that, you know, even introverts, if they're really excited and passionate and it's their life's work about something, her being an example because, you know, she's terrified, for example, of public speaking. But you will you will find it a lot easier to get out and do something if you're extremely passionate about it. And I find the same for me, too, is that if if I'm really talking about something that means a lot to me and is important, I tend to forget all of that fear that I have for the most part. Well, j- just like an extrovert who always wanted to build their own house, for example, will eventually need to go by themselves to start building things and working by themselves. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, they will overcome these fears. They will overcome these, these needs in order to do what they truly want. Yeah. Um, Jody, as we're approaching the end, I wanted to ask you a final question, or maybe it's a series of questions, however you want to take it. But before I do, I want to note how many notes you have. So you have a book in front of you which is covered with sticky notes identifying different places in the book that I guess inspired you. And you've got a notebook that you've written an ungodly amount of text in. So you've come prepared. And I wanted to to mention a quote that's actually in this book from Einstein. And he says, uh, he says, it's not that I'm so smart. It's that I stay with problems longer. (laughs) And one impression that I get from you in the two books that we've done now is that you've stayed with them for a long time to really mine them. And obviously in this conversation, we've, you probably only turned to about three of those notes in that book. I wish you'd have the chance to turn to more of them, but they all inform obviously the bigger conversation, even if you don't turn to them. But I did want to ask you, is, is there one thing that you wish we had talked about today in this conversation that struck you about this book or one thing that you wanted to talk to, talk to us about, about the world at large that, that, that you're thinking about because of this book? Like, what's the one thing that you wish you could, you could have this conversation be about? Or if we were to do another episode, what, we, what would you want it to tackle? Uh, I think we touched on it a little bit, but I think it's worth a lot more conversation. And that is, where do we go next with this? So we, we, know, that, um, we know that it's not a binary thing, right? And, and she does reference ambiverts and things like that. But wh- how can we get people to move in a direction of less, you know, categorization and putting people into groupings and really understand sort of the idea of spectrums and not try to put everybody into boxes that really is limiting. Uh, I think that this, this book and other and the work of a lot of the researchers in here is really important because if we don't do that, we're going down a really scary path where everybody just you know, this tribalism and everybody belongs to a certain tribe and we don't, we don't actually talk about ideas. We, we talk about people's built in, you know, things. And I think that's really not where I want us to go. So yeah, we're treating people as if they're too rooted Yeah, and there's one, um, personality theory that she mentions in the book called free trait theory, uh, towards the end where she talks about how, you pick the traits that you need from day to day, from time to That's time. Right. Obviously, um, you are what you continually do, right? So habits yeah. create you and you create your fate. And so, um, yeah, character defines destiny, right? So if every single day I'm sitting at a desk doing the same thing and I'm in that habit, then that's going to be my world and I'm going to be rooted in that habit. Yeah. But if I'm more shaken up, if, if one day I'm going to be brainstorming, for example, and the next day I'm going to be taking a field trip, but then the day after that I'm going to be in a cabin in the woods reading a book and my life is constantly be, being shaken up by work but also by my personal life, then I might be more able 
to put on different masks as I need them. And it doesn't mean that I have less integrity. It means that I'm more capable of sitting here right now having this conversation and then going and leading a group workshop and then going and becoming a part of a group workshop as a listener and doing all those things in the same day and picking things as I do them and being more fluid as a human being. I don't know if that's, that's a, a possible, plausible future, but it sounds like it's more desirable than being pigeonholed into these, you know, deep silos where, oh, you're an introvert? Well, you must be working in a research lab somewhere. Oh, you're an extrovert? Well, then you better be successful at the Harvard Business School, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a really good quote that, uh, as you can see, I put little hearts next to it on my book here. (laughs) Um, But it's from Anais Nin, and it says, Our culture made a virtue of living only as extroverts. We discouraged the inner journey, the quest for a center. So we lost our center and have to find it again. And I think that's really true. Like we, we have to find that balance in people, in, in our culture, in our societies. Um, if we go off in one direction, it always seems to go badly. So yeah. I think we need to definitely think about those type of uh, things that we need to do. And although it might seem on the surface like this book is, is you know, trying to pit one kind of personality against the other, I don't think that's what the intention is. I think that the intention is to sort of raise awareness of all these different traits and that whenever we seem like one thing is the wrong way to be and the other thing is the right way to be, we're almost always wrong about that. So so let's not do that, right? Let's, what is the next thing we're going to try to do and figure out? Cool. Uh, Jody, thank you so much for this conversation. As always, it's a pleasure. No, thank you. I, I love this. It's so great to, to come and talk to you about these books. To learn more about the book Quiet by Susan Kane and about Jody McPherson, my guest, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes and a way to get in touch with me on social media or by email to let me know what you think about this episode or any other. Now, your quote of the week was mentioned in this episode, and it's from Albert Einstein. It goes, it's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein, for our wonderful music. And special thanks for this episode to Jody McPherson and the City of Calgary for giving us a chance and a place to record. Next week, we're talking about the book 1984 by George Orwell with my friend Jarrett Hargreaves in Calgary. I'll see you then. <laughs>